Um, oh, the way I've always understood it is that in Breaking America, apparently the CBS convention appearance was a major turning point. That, that was pretty important. Can you say what it was about you? Yeah, the CBS, CBS has a big convention every year. Every record company does. This was CBS at the time. It was in New Orleans. And um, uh, it was important because we didn't have the attention of the record company at all. They could care less about our record. Only Steve Popovich cared about it, and us. And uh, actually, we saw internal memos that were infuriating. There was a guy, I even remember his name, a guy named Del Costello, who I'm um, sure is not around anymore, but uh, he was the head for the West Coast of CBS. And we saw an internal memo when we were going to the West Coast that he wrote to all the branch people and radio people, etc., saying, um, ignore this band. It's just a bar band. It's not important. And it made us furious. Uh, we were always jealous. Uh, I was joking with David uh, a few weeks ago. I remembered the band that infuriated us. It was a band called Crawler. No one knows now, but Crawler was getting all the promotional money. We were getting nothing. Uh, they just thought it was a ridiculous record. You know, it wasn't what was happening, and no one cared about it. And uh, it had to be built from the ground roots up. Um, and so uh, one of the steps in that is you try to get their attention at some point. And it was in January of 78, as I remember, the CBS record convention in New Orleans, and David managed to get us a spot on that, which is important because it showcases the new acts for the whole company from around the country, and probably some from around the world. And um, that was a really important show, and uh, we did a great show. We did a great show, and um, it really caught the eye of a lot of people there and probably did help a lot to turn it around. Though I would say it was never cut and dried like one thing. It was really mostly word of mouth. You know, I always describe it as, another, I'm referring to Jimmy Iovine again because it was another thing that always has stayed with me. Uh, when he was mixing with me one time, uh, every time at the same point in the song, he'd get up, he'd suddenly pounce up, and he'd go to the, one of the dials on the console, and he'd turn it wildly from left to right. He'd go, oh, this part, and then go left to right really fast. And he did it like eight times in a row. Every time we'd do a mix of the song, I finally said, Jimmy, what are you doing? Every time that comes around, you go, oh, I gotta do that. And he'd turn the dial left to right, he says, oh, man. Well, that's for the kid in Wisconsin. Every record I do, I figure you should put in one thing for the kid, the teenager in Wisconsin who's in bed listening on headphones because his parents don't want to hear the music and he's, got, and he's smoked a little dope and he's got the covers over his head and he's listening in the dark. And I think you got to have something where it goes fast, left to right, and he goes, holy shit, wow, ooh. And that was the thing for the kid in Wisconsin. And to this day, I've metaphorically expanded that to every song, anything for theater or film or music, but I do, I always think of the kid in Wisconsin. There's got to be something for him. And basically, I always think the kid in Wisconsin still exists in the widower in Miami, the nurse in Kansas, the 50-year-old businesswoman in Texas. I just, that's again the teenager who never dies. I think it's the kid in Wisconsin. That's the metaphor for me. With his head, with the covers covering his head, the headphones on, escaping in the dark. And you want to put the little thing where he travels back and forth. And uh, that, that came from Jimmy. But um, uh, where was I? You always get a run. So this, just for the record, this didn't break. There, you know, anyone who perceives it as there was a hype or anything, this was the opposite. Oh, no. This is the ultimate anti-hype record. Never got the benefit of any hype. Um, Saturday Night Live was a big help. We got to do Saturday Night Live. Once we did the convention, there was a little more attention paid, so they played the single Two Out of Three Ain't Bad, and that became a big hit single. That helped. But really, I still think the key to the record was word of mouth. You know, people who heard the record or saw the concerts and just became real fans. And really, the way, you know, to tell you the truth, I never knew how big the record was. You know, we all moved on around 19, though it is significant, I should tell you, there was a great time. Um, we did a fairly famous sequence of shows for the people who were involved uh, early on, fairly early on. And we did one in Washington, D.C. And David again managed to get, this is, the day, this is the era before MTV, so no one was doing videos basically, in 1977. And we did four songs, complete videos, and Bad Out of Hell even had not just live, it had some shots in a motorcycle in a graveyard in Queens, New York. They're kind of silly, but it was amazing for the time to do four, four or five songs live and with some extra footage. I think the only video I'm aware of before that was the Beatles had done some and Queen did Bohemian Rhapsody, but you know, you just weren't doing videos in those days. There was no outlet for them. But we did these videos and then David managed to get Don Kirshner's rock concert, which was a big TV show. Um, Don Kirshner was this comic figure who's known mainly because Paul Schaefer does a great imitation of him. But um, 
he would introduce the acts, and it was, it was that and Midnight Special. It was the only, there was no MTV. It was the only way you could get rock and roll on television. And um, he put on Bat of the Hell as a video. Uh, he agreed to do that, and we were thrilled. And that was a big break for us. And this is, you know, this is still, I think, 77. And um, we, we did a show in Washington, D.C., and then afterwards we all gathered around to watch it. And it was a horrible mess. I mean, I was thrilled they were showing it all. But the fact was, none of us considered the fact that it's a 10 minute song <laughs> and it's a TV show. So they edited it like crazy. But not only did they edit it, they broke it in half in the middle. I probably should have been grateful because they showed a lot of it. They probably showed like six and a half minutes, but they cut it at three and a half minutes. They stopped for commercials and came back. And Meatloaf went crazy when they cut for commercials. I mean, I was shocked too, but he went really berserk. And then when they came back, something was wrong with the tape. So it started to wobble. It was like, I'll be gone with the more. And he went berserk. And this is going out on television like this. And Meat went crazy. And um, uh, then we had to do a concert uh, the next night again in Washington, D.C. And David will probably tell you the story if you interview him. He, um, he had a really stormy relationship with Meatloaf. And uh, there was a whole series of corridors and hallways in this place we played in Washington. And there was one that was right out of a comedy and that it was a long hallway with like 20 doors. And I had no idea where to go. I was always in the daze by this point. I was so tired of touring, as was me. We were exhausted and we were just after four months. Um, it was so intense and exhausting. And uh, I was looking for some people, I guess. And uh, I kept opening doors and I couldn't find anyone. And I finally, as David will tell it, he was taught, me told, pulled him in a room. Me had no clothes on at all. He pulled him in a room and started strangling him. He started screaming, you damn, you, you scam artist, you shyster, you crook, you thief, you phony, because of what they did with his video on the television. And David's being strangled and me doesn't fool around. He wasn't just doing a fake strangling. David was turning blue. David will tell you this. He thought, I'm going to die. I'm going to die right here in the stupid room in Washington, D.C. I can't breathe. He felt a death rattle, you know, he's going, <laughs> he's turning blue, and he's, he, he says it like, I know I'm going to die, these are my last moments, and at that moment, the door opens, and it's me, looking for wherever I was, probably the food, and then the door opens, and I go, oh, and David's saying, I'm saved, and I go, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were having a meeting, and I closed the door and left, <laughs> and David says, now I'm going to die again. <laughs> So his chance to be rescued was lost. Because <laughs> it was so typical of many meetings, it wasn't that unusual for me to open a door and see me nude strangling David and calling him a thief. So I just thought it was another meeting. But, um, and we went from there and did a show in Philadelphia, which is known almost legendarily in certain circles as the Battle of Philly, opening actually for Southside Johnny, which was the band that Miami Steve was in. And um, it was one of the few shows we opened for anyone, but we, we, it was an important one because WMMR, the big station in Philadelphia, was broadcasting it live. So it was important exposure for us. And there were so many things that went wrong, I won't bore you with them, but they were really sorry they let us use the piano. I had, we didn't have our own piano. So I said, it's all right if we use your grand piano rather than some horrible little piano the theater has. I said, oh yeah, use our piano. They didn't realize how hard I played. <laughs> I played ridiculously hard on the piano. It comes from you know, wanting to bleed. And uh, I played so hard that six keys flew out of the piano. It was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. It just, you saw this key just fly out. The string broke and then the key gets ricocheted out. And they couldn't do, the, they couldn't use their piano for their show. <laughs> and they were furious. But then when me came out, the one thing they warned them about, they said, look, this is going out on the air live. Don't curse. We don't have a delay going. It's broken. So just control yourself. And I swear, the very, you'll have to bleep it. But Meatloaf comes out and he goes, how you doing, you motherfuckers? Philadelphia, motherfucking Philadelphia. <laughs> he just says motherfucking about 40 times in a row. And it was from there, it was downhill, because he was still upset from Washington. He was totally, I think, drunk. And he poured a bottle of gin, I think, on, over the head of Steve Buslow, the bass guitarist. While he's playing the bass guitar, it could have electrocuted him. He was throwing beer bottles behind him. They were crashing and breaking against the drums. It was really like a danger zone. But that was always the case, doing the show with me, was always a dangerous occurrence. I mean, I mean that literally. There's always a chance of physical danger. Because he was, in a way, a very scary thing. A guy who did not have any conscious inhibitions when he was on stage. And that could be dangerous for the other people. Even just the sound level, I remember we got so scared at one point, I, he had the loudest monitors ever, I think, for his vocals. And they were on the side, and they were right next to me on the piano, literally maybe three feet away, as his vocal monitor. His vocal monitor was just his voice which he needed because he has harder hearing in one ear. And uh, it's all top. He wanted heavy treble. So it's unbelievably bright, loud vocal. 
to make you understand how loud it is, they, they tested KISS, Gene Simmons told me, and KISS was, I, I might not have the number exactly right, but it's something like 143 dB or something. It was what a jet plane is taking off, KISS was clocked at, um, which was amazing, you know, considered permanent damage to your ears and all that. They did it for us, and we were like 8 dB hotter for the band, but the amazing thing is I asked them would they do the monitor, and the monitor was something like 160 dB, just the monitor. So I had the equivalent of a jet plane plus like 100 people screaming in my ear uh, for months. And I got really nervous. I remember I went to a doctor in Detroit who told me my hearing was perfect. But then again, he was a doctor in Detroit. <laughs> who knows? But um, it was really a diff it was an ordeal every night, the show. I mean, for a lot of physical reasons. Did you quit the tour? I had to stop. I had to stop after a year to write. Uh, I was exhausted, that was part of it, but I can't write on the road, I don't know how people do that, and uh, there was a second album to prepare for, and so I left the road after about a year to write, uh, and someone replaced me. It was, it was funny the, what it was like on tour for that first album with Meat Love. One story that really reflects a lot is that Meat was really caring about me, he really could tell that I was going through hell. I cared about him. We both knew we were going through hell, but we couldn't stop it. And David was in charge, and David was doing what he felt the manager had to do, you know, flog the product. So he wouldn't lay up on the schedule. We were trying to get him to ease up, because Meade had lost his voice. He had lost his voice so bad at one place in Omaha, uh, well, it, it was Omaha, that um, he couldn't speak before the show. He said, I can't talk, Jimmy. I want to do the show anyway. He said, why? I can't, I can't cancel. I can't cancel. I'm going to do the show. So he does this show without being able to talk, but faking it, and still made it work for sheer will and dramatic presence. Um, and when it's over, he did the same thing. He's fainted, and he pulls me close to my I did it, I did it. I didn't sing, but I did it. I got to do it. it was like, it was both heroic and appalling. Um, the audience sang along, they knew everything. It was sort of a lesson too about concerts, that the audience comes prepared. Um, but it got worse from there, and they couldn't, cancel things, you know, he'd get, he'd get his voice back, but lose it again. And there was one point halfway through the tour where, I forget where we were, but, um, oh yeah, we were in Canada, so it was something like Toronto or Montreal. It was a big hockey stadium. Again, we were bigger in Canada, so we were playing like 20,000 people. In Canada, we would still be playing a small place in New York, in uh, America. And uh, before we went on, I guess I was at the table eating something like, something like Oliver Twist. I, I probably looked like one of those kids eating the gruel. And it's just in slow motion, like, uh, uh, and me comes over really concerned, very sweet, and goes, Jimmy, you're dead, aren't you? You're really tired. I said, I'm exhausted, me. What about you? He says, I'm beyond dead, but I gotta keep going. I, you know, tomorrow night's Albany. I said, oh no, don't say that, Albany. So you don't want to play Albany, do you? I said, I can't, me. We gotta stop, Albany. It's just. We have to, we have to, but I sure don't like it. And I kept eating my gruel. And we went on that stage, and it was one of the most amazing concerts because it was in this hockey rink. They had a huge raised stage that they put up, about, you know, maybe 15, 20 feet off the floor. And we're performing on it. And when it comes time doing the encore, which was River Deep Mountain High, meets at the back of the stage, and, and I look in his eyes, and I always felt intuitively I knew what he was thinking. And maybe delusional, but I thought it. I said, that guy is going to do something now, I know it. Because when we had a talk right before the show, he said, I'm going to get us out of Albany. We're not going to play Albany. I'm not going to put you through that. I'm not going to go through it. I said, you can't, me. You already talked to David. He's not going to cancel it. They're not going to tell me what I can do. This is my life. I control my life. I can cancel my own life. And you know, I thought, whoa. He's going to do something tonight. And that night, during River Deep Mountain High, he goes running like a stallion. It doesn't stop at the edge of the stage just runs off the stage and falls pow, in a complete jumbled mess on the floor, like a 20 foot drop. And you look down and I could see it from where I was at the piano and you saw a leg totally twisted where well, you know it's been broken in about 80 spots, like the knee is parallel to the thigh, it's just horrible looking. And all the medics, and we just kept playing. We we're so used to anything, we never stopped playing. We just finished the song, instrumentally, and walked off stage. <laughs> we just, just like when I saw David choking him, or him choking David. Nothing surprised me, you know, nothing shocked me. So we kept playing, and, and then a guy named Sam Ellis, who was the tour manager, comes backstage, and we're all getting dressed in the lockers, and Sam says, okay, he's like in this really frenetic mood. He says, all right, this is really bad. 
Um, I don't know what to tell you, his leg is badly broken. All I can say is it's broken in a lot of spots. That'll require surgery. I, I can't get a lot of people to the hospital. I can only take maybe three people. No one raised their hands. And it wasn't that we were callous. We just had to get out of there. <laughs> you know, and it just, nothing was quite real in this tour. And no one raised their hands. It's, I can take three people. And it's like he was recruiting then. <laughs> Anyone want to come? And finally I raised my hand. He says, you want to come, Jim? I said, no, I, I really don't want to come, but I, I just have a question. Is there any more food? Because that gruel was terrible. Is there anything else to eat? He says, this guy has a broken leg. I know, I know, but I'm really hungry. <laughs> and I just went back to the uh, motel. And later we found we had to cancel about a month because of his leg, which was a blessing in disguise. And interesting enough, when we came back, we did a, a gig at Queens College, New York, that I think is one of the best shows I ever saw Meatloaf do. And one of the reasons is he did it in a wheelchair, in a cast, in a wheelchair. And it was, you know, was kind of like watching Franklin Delano Roosevelt with Iron Maiden. It was so weird to see a guy in a wheelchair. But it means he couldn't run around the stage, so it was just the music, just him singing it, and it was magnificent. You know, it didn't have all the theatricality, but he's still so theatrical and dramatic. And vocally, it was much better, because he could just concentrate on that. But that was the only break we had in the tour. And he kept touring way after I left, until his voice went so ragged, that's why he couldn't do a second album right away. He was just screwed up. You mentioned uh, iconography, mythology. How important in your mind is the cover of the album in terms of the impact? Did it, have any did it contribute to the... I, to me, it's crucial. I, yeah, the album cover is, you know, it's to me, I don't even disassociate it from the songs, the performer, the writing. It, it was an obsession of mine. I mean, it was my idea. I love this guy, Richard Corbin. I, I used to read heavy metal magazine all the time. I loved that kind of style. I wanted, it was the perfect style because it was comic book, but also thrilling and heroic. Um, violent, sexual, erotic, but it had a great wink to it. And that's what I thought the music had. And it was totally over the top. I mean, that was the thing I was always accused of the most. People would say, don't you think your music's a little over the top? And I always had the same answer, that it seems to me required to go over the top if you're doing rock and roll. And I always said, if you don't go over the top, you're not going to see what's on the other side. So what's the point? I thought, basically, you should start over the top and then find some new frontier. So I, I never cared about being over the top or excessive. And I wanted a cover like that. Now, CBS had picked out a cover which was a 50s housewife taking a meatloaf out of the oven and with meatloaf's head superimposed on the meatloaf. As you can see, I didn't consider this very mythic or iconic or heroic. I was horrified. And um, it was a really hard sell to sell him on this cover. And it was, I've never met Richard Corbin. We did it over the phone. I called him up. I told him the idea of the record the cover. I said, I was very, very precise. He's a brilliant artist. And I said, you know, it's got to be this motorcycle shooting out of a graveyard like a rocket ship at an angle with stones flying, a bat on a steeple, almost every detail was, you know, not every detail because he had a lot, but, and he sent me the cover done and that was it. It was perfect. Uh, and I think that was a really crucial part of the record. Uh, even to this day, I was pleased uh, I'm doing a show on Broadway and the set designer I felt really good about because when I met him for the first time, he said, you know, I'm probably the only set designer in America who subscribes still to Heavy Metal Magazine. And I bought Bat of the Hell before I heard any music. When I saw that cover, I said, I have to have this. And I don't think there are a lot of people who bought it for the cover, but it's one of the, I think, great covers. And it's certainly one of those covers that shows what the album sounds like. I mean, the album sounds, you know, it's like anything great, everything about it is unified. And that's an album that cover looks like the music sounds and like the show felt. Was it always going to be called Bad Out of Hell? Were there alternate titles? You know, I don't remember any alternate titles. There might have been, but to me, all I remember is Bad Out of Hell. And where did the, how do you remember that? Where did that phrase come from? All my songs were like, I always start with a title, 90% of the time, and then work in usually from the title. And I listen for everyday phrases, because language is so rich. I mean, I swear to God, if people want to think of what, how to write a song, just really listen, and I guarantee you'll hear 10 phrases a day that are amazing phrases. Um, you know, I just come into this room. In the elevator, this woman was saying, there are so many stores to go to, I can't begin to tell you. I thought, what a great title, I can't begin to tell you. I mean, it's amazing. You know, there's just the same with you took the words right out of my mouth. I don't know where I heard of it, but it's just what an amazing phrase uh, if you twist it around which is something that has to do with country music, does a lot, but I, I, st I once wanted to be a country singer a lot. And one thing I loved about country songs was the love of language. And that's something that 
Dylan brought back too in the Beatles with great intensity to rock and roll was the sense of language and um, which is really overlooked a lot. I remember as a kid being really resentful of a guy I loved on television, Steve Allen, he really started late night talk shows and one of his big bits was to make fun of rock and roll lyrics. He'd read them very pompous, pompously and he'd go, be Bapalula, she's my baby, be Bapalula and he'd make fun of him and I'd be there going, why does he make, that's a great lyric. I was thinking, how could anyone be so cool as to think of be Bapalula? And I never understood what he meant. I thought those were some of the, and you know, all the way to this day, some of the greatest lyrics aren't lyrics, the sounds. Um, uh, when I, I was a little kid, I, I remember records like The Lion Sleeps Tonight, uh, The Tokens, a whim a wet, a whim a wet, a wet, and I think, wow, how do they write that? It's so great. And if you're in love with sound and images and words, that's half the, the struggle, I think. And um, so, Bad of the Hell was, I probably heard it, God knows, you know, either it was just in my brain or I might have been watching a football game and turned out, wow, that, that guy, he shot out of that, that thing like a Bad of the Hell. And all I know is I thought, that is an amazing image, to be a part of the language. Just if you take it literally, like a bat out of hell, and it just grew from there. You know, the first thing is that it means fast, so I think I first constructed a story with a world where someone had to do something like a bat out of hell, which was leave when the morning came. Like the night, I've always loved the night, so it's like the night offered pleasures and uh, forbidden secret, you know, wonders sensual pleasures, but when the day came, he had to leave like a bat out of hell. But I always wanted to take it that extra step, which is why I wanted to, I knew I always wanted to write a great car crash song. Uh, and that's about mytholo mythology and iconography too in rock and roll. When I was growing up as a kid, I remember certain things really stood out, and one of them was there used to be a great series of car crash and motorcycle songs. And they made, they made a huge impact on me because they were stories. And rock and roll hasn't always embraced story songs. And, uh, I remember really vividly when I first heard a song called Tell Laura I Love Her. It was amazing to me. A story with a car crash and severed hand and a ring on the hand and Teen Angel. They were amazingly morbid and gruesome, but they're all about salvation, redemption, sacrifice. Very mythic, great stuff. And um, country had done a lot of that too, but the music wasn't as interesting to me for country. And so I, I remember thinking to myself, I gotta write the most extreme crash song of all time. And uh, I was, one of my favorite records ever was Leader of the Pack by the Shangri-Las, which was the first motorcycle crash song I remember. And um, also it was produced like a movie. It had dialogue in it, which really affected me. It was a guy named Shadow Morton. And uh, it had the girls talking, like a girl talking to her girlfriends about the boy she's in love with. And, uh, and then you heard the motorcycle. And it, had, it was like a movie. And I wanted records to be like movies. That was a lot of the point about it, the hell. Uh, I, I never wanted it to sound like a real thing. I never wanted it to, you know, in the 50s records started out like documentaries in that they, they were basically a documentary of a recording session. You know, when you heard the early Elvis or Jerry Lewis, you heard the pianist, the bass player, the guitarist in the studio. And that's what they thought records were, or an orchestra and a singer. What was so great about Phil Spector, my, my hero as a producer, is he made records where you couldn't imagine musicians playing them. Like if you listen to what I think is the greatest record ever made, you've lost the love and feeling, the Righteous Brothers, you can't imagine musicians there. It just sounds like the sound emanated from the earth or the heart or the soul. You can't imagine players. And I thought that was a great advance. It was like when they enabled the camera to move in movies. It was no longer just a play, it was a movie. It had its own imagination and no boundaries. And I felt I liked that with records. And I thought Bad in Hell should be in that tradition. You shouldn't just think of a band. It should be much more like entering a film. How, how is your wall of sound different than his wall of sound? Uh, well, I use different instrumentation. You know, it was far more rock and roll than pop, but I bar you know, you took the words right out of my mouth as a tribute to Phil Spector, and Todd Rundgren was great in helping get the Phil Spector sound. And there, you know, I don't want to get too technical, but Phil Spector did revolutionary things. You don't, he replaced the drums a lot with percussion. Uh, had the percussion play the parts rather than the, the snare drum. It was a big advance. Um, he tripled parts like crazy. He had three pianos playing live, four bass players playing live. Everything was multiple, so you never could really sense one instrument. Um, You've Lost the Love and Feeling is the best example of that. Now, anyone that wants to be a songwriter or a musician, I would say, listen to that record for four hours straight and you, that's all you need to know. Spectre never 
talk to you about that at hell. Is that true? No, he, he knew about it. One time I met him, he was too busy telling me jokes. He's a frustrated Borscht Belt comic. But he told me great jokes, but uh, <clears throat> he knew what I had done. He, sa he seemed to know everything about charts, and he knew that I idolized him. Who, whose uh, validation of the album meant the most to you? Who's, you know, who loving the record over the years has meant a lot to you? You know, it's hard to say. I'm always amazed. I'm, I shouldn't be if it sold 40 plus million copies, but I'm amazed. Every, to tell you the truth, every person who, you know, I read every bit of mail, and I, I'm moved by almost all of them. I mean, I've probably read 20,000 pieces of mail that just amazed me. Because they're often great stories and, you know, about people's lives being saved and all this. As far as people specifics, I'll tell you one that stands out is George Martin, the Beatles producer. When I finally met him, which wasn't until 1995, I think, uh, I was totally thrilled because he was a huge fan. And plus, I liked the way he phrased it. It, was, it wasn't um, artistic, so to speak. He, um, it was a party given by Andrew Lloyd Webber, who I was working with, and George Martin was there. And um, in the living room with like 20 other people there, George Martin suddenly stood up and did this toast and said, Jim, I just want to toast you because Bad Out of Hell 2 basically revitalized the record business last year in England, and I own three studios, so you personally brought me a lot of business. And there's nothing I could be more generally thankful for. Plus, I think they're absolutely brilliant records. And you're continuing the tradition I felt that we started with those Beatles, trying to push the envelope and the frontier in terms of sound. And I just want to thank you for some great, great recordings. And I was tingling. It was George Martin, who, you know, another hero. And that's another great example. You know, when you listen to, not the early Beatles, but you listen to Sgt. Pepper or the White Album, you don't envision a band in a room. You know, it's a whole other creation. He, he took records to a whole new place. And uh, Roy Thomas Baker, who produced Queen, was a big fan. That meant a lot to me. A lot of musicians, too numerous to mention. I was incredibly thrilled when Lou Reed wrote something for Musician Magazine that was so eloquent. Uh, most of this stuff is from Bad of Hell 2 because I wasn't reading stuff as much in Bad of Hell 1. But, um, Do you remember any of the swag? Oh, I remember negative reviews really well. Yeah. What was your favorite negative review? Oh, Dave Marsh was always the biggest asshole. <laughs> uh, Dave Marsh's first review for Rolling Stone was classic. Uh, Rolling Stone has always hated us. <laughs> they always had this thing. It never bothered me really a lot. It always sounds contrived, but it's true. I'm not really bothered by bad reviews, unless it really kills the project. I don't think it can if the thing's good. Um, Meat was more bothered, I think, than I was. And I remember the first Rolling Stone review was... Um, Dave Marsh, and uh, it was very short. That, uh, that pissed both of us off. <laughs> it was like two paragraphs. And he basically said it was junk, and that it didn't have a prayer. And he said, luckily, you won't have to care about this because it'll be forgotten in two months or something. And uh, he just slagged it off totally, you know. In, I can't even remember specifics, but everything, vocals, the writing, production. And um, what I remember about that was uh, when we did Madison Square Garden, he, uh, I went to see Springsteen in Madison Square Garden, I'm, I'm sorry, and he was there. He was part of Bruce's entourage, Springsteen's entourage. He's probably a perfectly fine person. Um, no, he is. He's probably a total schmuck, actually. Uh, and he was there, and uh, me and I went up to him, and I actually was going up to him because Elvis had died in 77. I mean, the summer we finished working on this record was a great summer to work. It was the summer that Elvis died, the summer of the Son of Sam. It was the perfect stuff going on for this record. And People won't remember it outside of New York, but it was the summer of the biggest blackout of the century in New York City in August 77. It was this amazing blackout, which, by the way, I'm convinced was caused by Todd Rundgren. And even though this is off topic, I'm still going to tell you that because it's worth it. Because I'm not making this up. I believe this totally. We were up in Woodstock the night of, I don't know if you know about this, but in 1977 in August was the biggest blackout in American history. A power grid that blacked out, I think, most of the East Coast, but all of New York City, all of New York City and New York State for something like 15 hours. And I think most, if I'm not wrong, a lot of the East Coast. But um, I certainly knew about New York. And we were up in Bearsville, and it started, well, that's part of the story. We were up in Todd's, and we were talking about the record. And we were very, I don't even know what stage we were at with the record, but it was summer, so we were probably pretty much almost done. Probably we were working on mixes, to tell you the truth. Todd had just had a new baby at the time. And uh, one thing I always remember that was great about Todd, he had these, the loudest speakers I ever heard, great speakers. And he, he would play the mixes in his home, and the little baby was about, I don't know, five weeks old? And it was right in front of the speaker in its crib. And this music was so loud, it was actually almost painful for me to hear. And I'm thinking of this little baby who's just there 
you know, sucking his thumb happily. And, um, and I remember saying to Todd, Todd, he goes, what? He said, the little baby, what about it? Is it breathing? I said, yeah, but then it's all right. I said, well, what about the sound? It's incredibly loud. He said, it's my house. <laughs> I just thought that was a good way to stake out the territory and make it clear at the beginning that this baby better be careful. Um, but uh, he then, he, I remember he said, um, ooh, I want to show you my Star Trek machine. I've done amazing things to it. And he had the Star Trek, um, I guess it's a pinball. It was beyond pinball. It was some sort of video machine, video game. At the time. I don't know what to call it because I don't remember the terminology at the time. But it was like an upright machine. I guess, you know, sort of revved up pinball thing, you know. I'm not finding the term, but you know what I mean. It's a video game. What? It's a video arcade yeah, game. Yeah, video arcade game. Arcade game, that's what I was trying for. And it was a, he revved it up unbelievably. There was like 50 wires coming out of it into his speakers. He had wires going into it. He would added sound effects, all kinds of lights. It was, he was an electronic genius. Um, this guy was making videos before people knew there were videos. Uh, so he was pretty astonishing at that kind of stuff. And he started showing us this game that was amazing. It was exploding. There were things coming out of the speakers that were so loud. The place was rumbling like Dolby Surround before there was Dolby Surround. It was this 20-minute display of pyrotechnics that was astonishing from his Star Trek arcade game. And then he's, he's doing it, and all of a sudden, the lights flicker really badly. He says, ooh, ooh, someone told me I should be careful. I, mm, I hope I didn't go too far. They flickered, and they went off, and they came back on again. He said, oh, I guess it's all right. I better not play anymore tonight, though. I think I might have gone a little too far. And then they moved on to another subject, and it was forgotten. And that was around um, 10, 14, I think. 10, 13, or 14. It was like between 10, 12, and 12, 15. I remember it was 10, 14, something like that. And so we went back to the city, me and I. And this is a great example of how you become obsessed with something. We're so obsessively talking about the mixes and the album. We're driving, meets driving. And we're talking, well, I think it should do this. I know the guitar's got to be up. And we're talking. Before we realize it, we know that we're halfway in New York City. And me goes, Jimmy, you notice something weird? I said, no, what, what do you mean? He said, look, look around you, look outside. I said, hey, it's all dark. And it's hard to explain this to someone who hasn't seen it, but to imagine all of New York City completely dark, and we've been driving in it for like five minutes, from the West Side Highway to Midtown, we're in Midtown Manhattan, complete darkness, and we didn't notice it for five minutes. And he goes, what's going on? Do you think there was a bomb of some kind? What could have happened? I said, I don't know. This is great, though, it's all dark. And then we see people running through the streets, and we ended up driving for two hours in total darkness. We turn on the radio, hear about the total, complete, oh, the, the amazing thing, the first thing we turn on the radio, and they're describing the blackout, and I remember this so well, on the news station they say, it's not totally clear what's causing this blackout. The police are saying, do not panic. They're gonna have this under, uh, under control. And then, you know, 20 minutes later they say, okay, there's a bulletin, we, we seem to get it somewhere. The power authority has notified us that the blackout started in Newburgh, New York. Newburgh, New York is one of the two major transmitters and, and conduits for electricity for New York City. It's But you can also, when you forgot, you might want to do it if you want to just throw out names for me to oh, do. Oh, yeah, that would be, if you don't mind doing that first. No. Okay, just use a pad. Um, so, what did a guy in the radio say? Oh, so we hear a bulletin and he comes on with an update. He says, Here's the latest information on this blackout. It seems to have started at one of the two major electrical transmitter conduits, whatever the word is, for all of the East Coast, which is located in Newburgh, New York. 
for those of you who don't know, that's right around Woodstock, New York. And it's exactly Woodstock. It's the same place. And uh, he said, and it's, they said that it seems to be a transmitter went down at 10, 14 p.m. and caused a chain reaction all through the Northeast. And this was the blackout. And I'm convinced to this day, it's just no accident. I mean, it could be an accident that it started flickering, but it was right when Todd had one of these huge blasts on his Star Trek arcade game. And I'm, I like to think, anyway, that our record and Todd caused the blackout of 77. And it was also the year, you know, it was the summer Elvis died, and it was the summer of the summer, Son of Sam. Is so there something of Elvis in Meatloaf? Oh, yeah, Elvis. Meat has Elvis in him. He, um, I mean, I've never seen him with a peanut butter and banana sandwich, but he's, he's, he's the closest thing to an Elvis. And I loved Elvis. And I'm a, I'm a true Elvis lover. I loved Elvis when he made horrible movies and was fat. I think the fat Elvis was just as great. I mean, Elvis's brilliance was he transcended everything. Bad songs, being fat, bad movies, horrible co-stars, you know, like Shelley Fabrese or whoever it was. It didn't matter. It was Elvis. He could do anything. And I think, uh, you know, Meat has a little bit of that. He, uh, there's a lot of Elvis soul in him. You know, uh, it's funny because I took him in a totally different direction with the kind of writing I did. Except, the, you know, the one song that's interesting about that is Two Out of Three Ain't Bad. That came very specifically, I do remember that one, was a, a friend of mine named Mimi Kennedy, who's a TV actress now. Um, wonderful actress. She, uh, she was my best friend's uh, girlfriend at the time, now wife. And I remember her telling me, she said, you know, when I was probably complaining why no one liked my stuff and couldn't get a deal, she said, well, it's tiny. Your stuff is so complicated. Can't you write something simple? And, and while she was saying that, the oldie station was on the radio and was playing that old Elvis song, I want you, I need, whatever it was, I want you, I need you, I love you. You know, I, I started singing my own song, but it was, I want you, I need you, I love you. Um, and she said, why don't you write something simple like that? I want you, I need you, I love you. And I said, well, I'll try. I don't try to make them complicated. I remember going home and I tried so hard, but the best I could do was, I want you, I need you, but there ain't no way I'm ever going to love you. Don't be sad, because two out of three ain't bad. So it was still a twist, but it was my closest to a simple song. And, um, and one Elvis could have done. But I always thought me had a lot of Elvis in him. He was a showman in the same way. You know, it's, it's great because it is connected. This goes back to Jim Morrison, The Doors, my favorite group from the 60s. But um, they always use the word shaman a lot. Shaman being the tribal leader who would conduct the rituals, the sorcerer, the tribal leader, and the guy who would hand out the magic mushrooms or the guy who would say the right prayers. Uh, basically, it's, you know, if the Pope was cool, he'd be a shaman. And um, the biggest shaman. And um, it was always interesting to me that meat was kind of like a shaman, which is so close to showman. And uh, I don't know if there's any connection linguistically, but a great showman to me is also a shaman in that it tears, on, tears open doorways, lets you see things behind doors that you would never see, and, and creates altars so you can worship things that you're not aware of. Uh, it shows you the underbelly, and that's always interesting more than anything else, what, the secret underbelly of things. Now let's just, I'm going to give you a list of names. This is like a board association. Give me like 30 seconds on what they brought to the party. Uh, you know, on Bad and Out of Hell, what they brought to the whole experience. Okay. Uh, Ellen Fold. Well, Ellen was a brilliant actress and a stunning singer. One of the best voices I've ever heard in my life, one of the best presences. She was great with me because she, I once called her a stand-up tragedian as opposed to a stand-up comedian. She stood there and she emanated a sense of tragedy, but she was so funny. And the whole Beauty and the Beast thing was really built around him and Ellen. Uh, they were an amazing duo, and she was an inspiring person to write for, and she was a key. It was very much important that that girl always be with Meatloaf as a contrast, and she was the first, and she was stunning. Uh, Carla DeVito. Carla replaced Ellen. Ellen wasn't able to go touring, and Carla replaced her as a live performer, and Carla was dazzling. Um, they were very different. Ellen was a great live performer, and Carla was a great live performer. Carla was a little more oriented to the comic and the bubbly. Ellen was a little more powerful and uh, tragic element to her. Um, but Carla just, she was a star. I mean, they both should have been major stars, no doubt about it. I mean, I'd trade in 50% of every diva out there now. I mean, you know, for every thousand notes that Mariah Carey will ever sing, Ellen could sing one that would blow it away. And um, nothing against Mariah Carey. I, I'm sure she's fine. <laughs> uh, it's just, they were both astonishing performers more than anything. And they both had theater training, so they both had that amazing presence. 
of knowing what they were on stage as being different than life. And uh, let's give the manager a little, uh, a little 30 second bite. Sonnenberg. David Sonnenberg just loved this. He was a lawyer. He was a theater lawyer, so he also had a theater background. And then he, he became a lawyer for clients, and he was Meatloaf's lawyer, and then became a manager. And mainly he, what he had is fanatic devotion and belief and fiery. He was very fiery and determined. He just would stop at nothing, and that was critical. He wasn't my manager when we did Bad of Hell, but he was a key force in that he believed. And again, uh, you can't underestimate the power of belief. It sounds sentimental, but in the record business and in entertainment generally, it's not. It's translated from something sentimental into something actually practical and physical. If you have an aura of belief in something, it becomes physicalized, and you can force people to do things. You have because people are all weak, and they all want it on their shoulders. No one wants to be fired or blamed, and they're happy to see someone who believes, because then they know deep down they can say. Well, I can blame it on David. I can blame it on Popovich. There's someone else to blame it on. And in a way, that's what a believer is. Someone who can, who's not afraid to have it blamed on him. You know? Are there any other true believers who should be mentioned that we've left out of this story? Oh, yeah. I'm sure there are. I mean, that's the biggest scale. But there are a lot of people who work with Steve Popovich, just unknown people now. Marty Mooney and Stan Snyder, I remember. Sam Letterman. Uh, there were people at CBS, uh, Lenny Pizzi, you know, there were people here and there who believed in it. There were definitely people at radio. It, you know, I mentioned Scott Muni at NEWFM, a guy named Kid Leo, Kid Leo who works for Sony now in Cleveland. He was the top of rock and roll there. Uh, there was scattered all over the world. There were people who definitely believed, and mostly there was the audience. There was the kid from Wisconsin, so to speak. There were just kids. Uh, and I don't want to even marginalize it like that. The kids went up to age 40 or 50, they always did, um, who just believed in the music and they responded to that. And um, they were invaluable. What were they connecting to in your mind, you know, even this, this distance? What, what was it that people had this incredibly powerful and enduring connection to? Well, I think they were responding to two things. They were responding to the, the writing itself and the performing. And both things shared one thing. They were heightened is the word I always think of. They weren't just ordinary. They weren't real. They weren't domestic. They weren't acoustic. I'm not doing that in a literal sense, but the metaphorical sense. They were, you know, the Spinal Tap tradition, they were amplified to 11 as a starting point. They were amplified beyond amplification. Also in terms of content, they were amplified beyond amplification. I mean, this was rock and roll that didn't just think you made the music go to 11 in amplification. You made the images go to 11 and you made the emotion. It was all extreme. It was about extremity. It's, you know, it was in the musical sense the same thing extreme sports would be to a kid watching ESPN2. It was about testing boundaries and not being, I don't want to make it sound too heroic, it's more about not being afraid to find doors closed and just open them up and go to another place. And not afraid to make something excessive and too much. And especially not afraid to go over the top, like I said. Because if you don't go over the top, you don't see what's on the other side. So not having any leashes, to feel free to be unleashed. And they were responding to something mythic. And to me, rock and roll was always mythic. There can be good rock and roll that isn't, but I wasn't interested in domestic rock and roll. I didn't care what Joni Mitchell felt yesterday when she had asparagus and it reminded her of a child when her father hit her. I, you know, that's great if you can do it, but that what I wasn't interested in to me. I was interested in gods and goddesses and people who thought they were gods and goddesses or tried to be. I was interested in in a massive scale, in nightmares, in dreams as opposed to reality, and things that went on in the subconscious rather than the ordinary daily life. Everything heightened or hidden away or secret or amplified or mythic, that's what I think they were responding to, because not many people were doing that. And I, I think it's worth doing. It's something I respond to. How hard or impossible an act was it to follow? Meat love? Bad out of hell. Oh, bad out of hell? Looking back, it was probably impossible, but again, at the time, I didn't think that way. I just thought, well, I've got to do something. I've got to write more. Um, as, a, as a full album, I don't know if I'd ever top it. You know, it's just like I said, the best thing I'll ever create in my life, I did in my school senior year. The best album I'll probably ever make is Bad of the Hell. I can't imagine, you know, making a better one. I guess I could, but I, I can't imagine it. Because it, it, was, it was like, you know, like any birth. It, it was just, it just poured out. I didn't really expect to do an album. I didn't know what that meant. So whatever I was doing was so intuitive that I didn't know how to censor myself or know that I w didn't know what I was doing. You know, I was too smart to know I was really stupid. And so um, I just did it.
And when you listen to Bad Out of Hell, or people come up and talk to you about it, or you read it, what makes you most proud about Bad Out of Hell? I think the fact... If you could say I'm most proud, it's a question more. Well, I, I think I'm most proud, first of all, that people find it worth mentioning uh, and writing about, particularly it's what they've written. Um, this woman set up a fan website for me that she's run for like, God, 15 years or something, and she sends me all this mail. Like it's, it's impossible in a way. It's like 100 pages a day maybe, but I read it, pretty much all of it, and of those 100 pages, there's always like every day 15 that I just want to say forever. You know, people who basically say their lives have changed, and they tend to be all ages too, and it's always amazing how important music can be to people how it can in fact save a life, or be a major part of saving a life, or transforming a life. And um, I'm just really proud that it can affect them so much, and it's like, I don't know, you feel like a key being stuck in an ignition outlet. Like, basically what you feel like you're doing is you're igniting something. And um, that's what religion's supposed to do, philosophy, art, sex, food. <laughs> Everything I think of that's good is supposed to ignite something, set something on fire and start it going. And I think. That, that album did that for a lot of people. And for a lot of people, I think it was an introduction to things operatic and mythic and heightened. They didn't know it from pop music. So I'm most proud that it did that. that it, I'm most proud that it did that and that you know, 45 million people out there actually bought it. Multiple copies, still biased to listen to it. And to me, it doesn't sound one hour out of date. It was never in any date anyway. It was completely out of its time then. So it won't really get dated because it didn't fit whenever it was made. It might, you know, in another hundred years be just right. I don't know. Um, I'm just proud what it represents because what it represents is what I love and what I always responded to. And it's good to get it down so other people can respond. And last question in the chair with the back. Uh, what you say it, it seems to be that people talk to you about it changing their lives. How did that help change your life? I don't know. I just don't know. It, um, in the most practical sense, it set me on a path I never expected to do, of being a record producer and songwriter for the next 25 years, and I never expected to do that. I expected to be doing films and theater. So there's that factor, just realistically. And also, on a deeper level, it showed that I wasn't insane thinking I could you know, create something that could reach people. And you know, it's sort of like in the end that's worth that and, you know, uh, $3 is worth a cab ride. You know, it's still just a thought. It doesn't get me through every day. Because most, basically every day I'm thinking, i got to write something else. So, But when I take the time, if I do, it's something that at least I can say I did something I'm really proud of that affected a lot of people. And that was a real challenge. And was done in a way courageously, if you can do anything courageously artistically. And uh, it certainly changed what I would do for the next 30 years of my life. And that's a lot. Great. I wanted to ask you about the SNL thing. <clears throat> and how long were Ellen and Nate a couple? You know, I don't know how long they were a couple. They were, um, you know, I, I was mostly aware of it when we were up at Woodstock recording. I don't think it was a long time. Um, Meat had a lot of interesting dalliances. <laughs> he was a bit of a Don Juan, which is another thing I was proud of. I remember when we wanted to sign him, I was the only person who really was confident Meat would be really popular with girls. And everyone gave me really trash about that. They, they'd say, what are you crazy? I mean, teenage girls aren't going to like this. And I'd say, I think you're wrong. I think you really, you know, it's the usual thing. It's just like the music. So they want to see people like, you know, look at Peter Frampton at the time. They want to see, you know, real thin, great looking guys. And I'm saying, I don't agree. I, I just felt, you know, that for one thing, I felt he was really, a, he's really good looking. I mean, it's funny to say that, but you look at him, especially then, he's inflated, so to speak, but he's, gr he's good looking. He's cool. He's got that Elvis thing. And plus, I always felt, and this is just an intuition, that women would have a thing of, like a mothering feeling, a baby, like it's a big baby, and they'd want to mother him. And, and I always thought that was underestimated. I, I mean, I've always felt that when men decide what appeals to women, they're really idiots, which they are anyway, but especially when they decide what women are attracted to. And I thought women would definitely be attracted to Meatloaf because he had a humor, a wild kind of 
almost pagan sensual abandon, in spite of his size, which showed a great kind of gutsiness and courage, and because of his size, I thought it would bring out a certain, I don't want to sound cliche, but a certain mothering instinct that, that women would respond to, because he was like both a big baby and the knight on shining armor who was going to rescue them. I thought he'd be both of those things. And he was very popular with uh, women. And um, thank God, because they were half the population. Right? <laughs> and I also thought men would respond to him because, I, you know, it's a similar thing. Um, everyone was acting like the guys only wanted to see these great looking guys, you know, because they wouldn't envision them like that. I thought the opposite. I thought guys are going to really identify with meatloaf because everyone I knew, every guy, even a great looking guy, basically considered himself looking like terrible, you know, an outcast. And it's certainly most rock and roll teenage males considered themselves outcasts and they wanted to gather with other outcasts. And here was finally a lead singer who was an outcast, physically embodied what an outcast was. He's the big fat guy you made fun of in school. And yet he broke the chains and said, I'm not the big fat guy you make fun of in school. I'm the big fat guy you better lick my boots, buddy. And I thought that was a good transformation too. So I, I saw no way that boys or girls, so to speak, wouldn't respond to him on a visceral level. I hadn't taken into consideration 50-year-old record executives who had a whole different opinion, but that's always the least valid. So I'll always trust the hormonal, instinctive, emotional instincts of teenagers above anything. So is that the story of 40 million outcasts? Oh, absolutely. I think it's definitely the story of 40 million outcasts uh, trans transformed into heroes. I think Bat of the Hell is about outcasts as heroes. That, in that sense, it's no different than Batman. Um, really, the great superheroes of comic books. And really, Batman's the only great one, in my opinion. The only great uh, superhero. I say that only incidentally because I'm doing a musical of Batman. <laughs> but um, I've always loved Batman because of that, because he's, he's really human. And he's the way he is because he saw his parents being slaughtered. He's a total psychotic, neurotic, non-functioning human being. Who, you know, a playboy who has a totally superficial, silly life by day, and by night gets dressed up in cod pieces, fetishistic vinyl, with enormous nipples, and, <laughs> and goes out with Robin on these adventures. I don't think you can find anything kinkier. <laughs> and um, yet he's a hero. And it's that combination that's really cool. The complexity of the human element, the vulnerability, and the power and just sheer visceral fun and excitement combined of the gothic transfigured image. Was this the dream record of you as a kid, you think? Would it have blown your mind? Oh, yeah, I, I would have loved it. I still love it. I, I, I'm still amazed when someone puts it on and I go, this is fuck great. Just great. I wouldn't change a note. I mean, it's, you know, when you say what I'm proudest of, I'm probably proudest of the fact I wouldn't change a thing. I just love the fact there's something that exists there that's exactly right. It's just nothing. I can't think of anything wrong. Um, it's, I would have loved it as a kid. I wish I had heard it. Um, it's definitely what I would have responded to. It's, you know, it's basically bebop a lula carried to the ultimate extreme. <laughs> you know, that's all it is. But that ultimate extreme is pretty thrilling when you get there. Starting out live? Yeah. Do you want, I'm starting out live. Uh, I hear he broke uh, a chandelier. Well, that was just, that's a great metaphor for the whole experience of Meatloaf, where everything's mixed together. He was so nervous doing Saturday Night Live, because it was a big deal for us. And it was also the week he it was on the cover of People magazine, on the, not on the main cover, but on the, on the cover, but on the top left. And it was the first week we were really breaking through and making a dent. And Saturday Night Live was a big deal also because we knew all the people. He was really close to John Belushi. And I remember it was a really cool show to do. I mean, this is the first year, I think, or a second year. I don't remember if 77 was the first year or not. But it was right at the beginning. I think it might have been the first year. It was, I don't know, we were on this show. It was actually a great show. It was the one where um, Dan Aykroyd did the Bassomatic, where he put the fish in the uh, blender. <laughs> uh, it was a classic skit. And, um, and uh, Christopher Lee was the host from horror movies. It was a really cool show to do. And I don't remember being nervous. I always had a strange sort of out-of-body kind of way of looking at it. But what I remember was when I played the opening to 2 or 3 in bed, they had a close-up of my hand on the piano because we did the rehearsal. And I just remember as I was playing it, having this really kind of wonderfully giggly thought that, hey, there's 25 million people watching this live. I could just go like give them the finger. <laughs> I can do anything I want now. I'm in control right now. It was just a cool feeling. It was kind of giddy. And then Meat was really nervous, but he did really good. They didn't let us do the long song, so I wish we could have done Paradise by the Dashboard Light, but we did it all revved up with no place to go and two or three in bed. And when the show was over, 
we went backstage and meat was always just as intense after the show. Uh, it was just, he had to be really careful because it didn't go away. He was very explosive after the show because it was still there, all that volcanic energy. And um, we were in the green room, I remember, our dressing room, and he said, how did you do, Jimmy? I did okay, didn't I? I said, you did really good, me. Stay alive. People Magazine, we're gonna, we did it, we did it, we did it! And he threw his fist up and he went, we did it! Unfortunately, there's this huge chandelier right there, and he busted the whole thing. It came crashing down all over us in shards of glass. You have to understand, I was always psychotically scared about broken glass. I had had a lot of experience with glass getting embedded in my eye and things. And, and I, all of a sudden, there's literally a hundred pieces of broken glass in my hair and my head. And all I thought is, you big, fat, dumb pig. <laughs> it's like, it was all the things mixed together. Here, you have to have your moment of triumph and, and bring down a glass breaking all over me, a chandelier. And I, had, I remember I had to go home and take a shower carefully to get all this glass. I always remember all this glass in the little uh, drain of the shower thing. And wondering if I got it all out so I could rush back to the party <laughs> for Saturday Night Live. Uh, he just ignored it. He probably had swallowed the glass and ate it. But I remember that was kind of metaphorically perfect. The moment of triumph also involved catastrophe and danger. But it was cool. It was, um, it was a cool thing to do that show. Every little step was cool because it was the first time. And, uh, and then you get a little used to it, but it, not a lot. It's still amazing. Like, I, I have to admit, I still i have never stopped getting chills when I hear a song of mine on the radio. That's never gone, which is neat. In that way, I'm still like the kid from Wisconsin. What was the first time you heard it when Gotta Hell something? Really? I remember it really well. We were at the um, record plant. We were mastering the record, actually. And NEW, I guess, I don't know all the details, but I guess NEW was playing it before we did the finished mastered version. And while we were there, we're sitting around, unless we were mastering a single, I don't know exactly, but I know we were in the mastering room of the record plant in New York City. And someone said, hey, your song's on the radio. And we went, what? And we went running into the other room, and there was WNEWFM in New York, Scott Muni, playing back to back. And, and we heard him announce it, because that's what they knew he was going to do. And he said, okay, as promised, here are the two big ones from the really big one. Bad in hell, meatloaf, here they are. Bad in hell and paradise by the dashboard light. And looking back at it, now I know that he went, God, now I can go take a dump. <laughs> and I don't have to come back for 20 minutes, thank God. But they played the whole 20 minutes, and we sat there like, Worshippers, you know, we, we it wasn't like we had done it. We just uh, and I and looking back, I could remember Jimmy Iovine saying, "It sounds great. It's on the radio. It sounds great." And it was so magical to me to hear it on the radio. And it never, it never has left me to this day. If I hear a song of mine on the radio, I still get chills. It's like, and partly because I feel connected to that kid in Wisconsin under the sheets and that widower and that woman working in Texas. It's, you know, radio's a magical thing, and that that's something that. Uh, you know, I suppose people do it from every art form, but I think radio may be the most intimate and music is the most... I, I always think of music as still the most jugular of art forms. That's the word I think of. Actually, when you ask me why I think Bad of Hell works, it's, uh, one of the words I should use is I think it's a jugular record. You know, there are a lot of records that are, you know, capillaries and things like that, but this is really the jugular vein, and um, you connect to it. It's like hooking up to an IV unit. <laughs> That's how bad in hell should be heard. They should hook up an IV unit, and it should go right into the bloodstream. And um, I, I just remember that, always thinking that music more than anything, and it's true, people use music the most personally of every art form. I mean, I think people define their lives, style their lives, shape their lives, more to music than they possibly could to film, television, or anything. It's less spectator art than one that's, in the pure sense, is communal. You know, you do ingest it, and it does become, you take it intravenously. I think music is an intravenous art. <laughs> and, and they can figure out how to stop downloading, but all I care about is it's intravenous, <laughs> and that's a good thing. Great. So now we take a minute or two. Do you yeah, think a minute, why don't you take a minute or two? Um, can we maybe wait and grab that?
introduction. So. Yeah, I won't be doing much though. Whatever you're comfortable Let's see. Some things I haven't played for 25 years. Who was the keyboard player? What? Who was the keyboard player who went on the road after when you left? Do you know? Paul Jacobs. Oh, because there's always pictures that have come through the archives that are there where they, you're credited as being in the picture. Oh. <laughs> they never got his name. He was the guy I replaced in the last Lampoon show. He did one the year. Uh, mm. oh. He can't play on this piano. That was the case of the piano in the other one, the ultimate, al the um, classic album thing, either. I just don't play, I never played piano on my records, and um, I only consider myself a really good pianist I'm playing solo, and um, that's why I never did the records, I think I play too much, I, I play all the parts, and so I arrange them, I like, um, I take what I'm playing on the piano and divide them up, and I play so much, but then if I'm playing with them, it's redundant, I just am used to playing the drum, I do the drums with my feet, <laughs> I do like every part, so the piano part says it's too cluttered, and Roy is a genius pianist, so it cleans it up. I play a few little things. I actually play that riff in Battle of the Hell. Uh, that's me doing the riff. Um, but it's so hard, and you need a fast keyboard. Are we ready? Yeah. We're ready. What do you remember as the spark musically for Battle of the Hell? Musically or lyrically? Either one? Uh, well, it started lyrically. It started with um, the title and the choruses and the overall idea, and the impulse to write the ultimate car cr slash motorcycle crash song. So that was the lyric inspiration. Musically, I can't even remember specific. Um, I know this, that it started, I know, I just remembered one thing. I was with Meatloaf when he was doing Rocky Horror Show in LA, writing. I was out there, and um, 
one of the songs I was doing with him was the new uh, version of Jailhouse Rock, and that's where the intro came from. I just actually remember that, that this was Jailhouse, you can actually tell it's Jailhouse Rock if I just do it. <laughs> But when the tour party in the county jail, everyone's dancing, they began to win. You know what I mean? It's that same, you know, that Jailhouse Rock has. And that started as the new Jailhouse Rock we were going to do, which is the wild Jailhouse Rock. We gave up a Jailhouse Rock, but I kept that, because uh, I like that. <laughs> and that turned And then I added the fast riff, which I can't play on this piano, because the piano is too retarded and slow. But it, I couldn't even fake it on this. It's not fast enough. I can't do it. It's really got to have fast fingers. Um, but it developed from there. But that was the opening. I do remember it started as Jailhouse Rock. And um, otherwise, I, I don't remember any particular musical sparks uh, for that. Most of it was lyrical. Um, except it was all based around a sort of uh, F with pedal F bass. Sort of. <laughs> rhythm over S. Um, but no, I, I can't, that song developed so wildly by the end. I don't even know how I wrote some of that. <laughs> I, I listened to it and I said, how did I come up with that? Um, but most of that was sparked by the story and by the lyrics. What do you remember from the intro? Uh, so you took the words right out of my mouth. Did you were... Well, that I remember really well because that was my tribute to Phil Spector. And um, it's funny, because it doesn't really sound like a Spectre's thing, but I was thinking very basics. So one of the most basic things for rock and roll, which to me was more the who, was... <laughs> ...power chords. And uh, that's in the who from my generation who won't get fooled again. I just love... Uh, not necessarily those particular ones, but that's the basic idea, power chords. And somehow that became, with an added melody in the right hand, sort of specterish when you added a... That has a little bell-like feel. And specter was great with chimes and bells. And uh, I loved all that. Lots of percussion and bells and chimes. So I think I just put them together for the intro. And Summer Night? I have no idea. I, I know it was written, I was writing it for my grand epic, which I'll get to someday, which is this rock and roll Peter Pan, Neverland. And that was the wedding vows of Wendy and Peter. Uh, they get married in it. And uh, the Lost Boys are all the sort of the altar boys of the ceremony. And uh, I do remember writing it for that on a hot summer night, which will offer your throat to the wolf with the red rose. It, it seemed like a great wedding vow to me. <laughs> that was my idea of a cool wedding vow. And so that's what the spoken thing was. And it wasn't necessarily made for this song. It just was. Originally, Bat of the Hell had another big speech in it, but David Sonnenberg and Meatloaf both refused to put two speeches on the record, which I really, that's the only thing I regret, come to think of it. I, the other speech is a very cool speech, and I wish it had. Uh, been there, short one, but it was cool. Before all wrapped up with no place to go. Were there definite characters you had in mind, like uh, for this? I mean, did you do a backstory and all, or you, it was vaguer than that and more? Perhaps just for the whole the album? album. Yeah, there was the well, the backstory. If anything, was that it was all to me adventures in Neverland. It all came from that source. I basically have written, you know, ninety percent of all my songs is that because I love those characters of Peter and Wendy and Captain Hook. But I, my version is very science fiction and erotic, and, and Peter's really an 18-year-old kid, boy. And Wendy starts off as a 16-year-old girl, but ends up as about 35, 40-year-old woman. Um, so they all accept, and Paradise by the Dash for Light was even that. It was like them looking back, a sort of comic version. But um, every single one of them that I can think of, yeah, that was the, the one thing I had in mind. Do you think this album, one of the things it, it connects with, the reason people connect with it is that it had a different kind of more realistic view of sexuality with the humor and everything in it than 
most like disco music was very mechanical in its view of sexuality. I guess you could say that. It's always hard to say how people perceive sexuality, you know, in our music. Um, what I like about it is, is that it combines very raw and specific erotic sexual imagery with the humor. Uh, you know, I'll tell you, the line I'm probably proudest of in the whole record, I'm proud of so many lyrics in the record, but I'm probably proudest just because it's the most daring one, is it's my favorite song for Crying Out Loud, the final song, um, which I actually did just start with, a, uh, if I can remember it. which actually became one of my favorite regressions. Um, that started with that motif and then the lyrics came. But um, the line that, I don't have the lyrics in front of me, but um, uh, you have the lyrics, I can read it yeah. if you want. I can be specific. It would be, you know, it would be better if you looked at the lyrics and again, or is it okay to read them? Um, I can refresh my memory. I, think it's, yeah, refresh. I pretty much remember, I want to be sure though. And it'd be great if you're going to tell a story, if uh, we could get your body turned a little bit, if okay. you swing one leg around and kind of talk to David chest to chest. Oh. Yeah, it's a lot. It's, it's and you may have to turn her back around to the place, profile, you know. Yeah. I need to take my glass off. I certainly don't print this too big. <laughs> Um, so, where were we? For continuity sake. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, I, um, I think in a way, it may be perverse of me, but I'm very proud, for crying out loud, I love all the lyrics, and I love that it's so ecstatic. And a lot of letters I've gotten over the years, thousands of them, it's so amazing to me how often this is quoted as the favorite song, even though it's the one that in a way got the least exposure. But I love it, and I think his performance is astonishing. And I love the lyric where it goes, um, and now the chilly California wind is blowing down our bodies again, and we're sinking deeper and deeper in the chilly California sand. And I know you belong inside my aching heart. Can't you see my faded Levi's bursting apart? I love that, because <laughs> it's, it's so blatantly a boner line. <laughs> but, and the, having the gall to give it to me, love. I had so many people say, is that because the pants are too tight? Is that because the weight, or is that a metaphor? I said, actually, it's just a boner line. <laughs> it's just, I just want to put it in there. And even to this day, almost every song I write has what I call the boner line in it. <laughs> it's just some line that's so specifically erotically sexual that it doesn't even try to be poetic, you know? And yet I find that very poetic, you know? You belong inside my aching heart. Can't you see my faded Levi's bursting apart? I don't know. That makes little sense to me. But that's an example. That's so specific uh, sexual reference in a song that's so ecstatic that I just like that kind of uh, incongruity. Just like Paradise by the Dashboard Light is a fun and a joke, but it isn't. It's the opposite. It's, um, it's actually a very serious song. I mean, if you look at it as an overall piece, it's about how two people totally ruin their life because of, I guess you can say this in VH1, a boner, <laughs> the, because of a sexual impulse. One night, to fulfill a sexual desire, their whole lives are ruined. <laughs> and the whole song is actually, to me, a very despairing song, but told with incredible, you know, joie de vivre, and just fun. And um, sometimes I always wonder whether people read the final section or hear it, you know. It's, you can't get much more bleaker than, you know, I swore, I promised I'd love you till the end of time. You know, I'll keep that promise, I'll keep that vow, I'll love you till the end of time. So now I'm praying for the end of time to hurry up and arrive. <laughs> I just think that's about as true and as bleak a thing as you could say about, you know, the sexes and how they get together. So it's interesting that the last two songs on the record, one of them is a, a comic song that has a very dark underpinning, and the other is a very romantic, soaring, somewhat dark song that actually is very ecstatic. Um, even though it's about crying, ultimately it's about loving someone because they're not afraid to cry. Musically, where did Paradise start, do you remember? Paradise definitely started with the... Just a boogie-woogie bottom. That's all it was. It was I, just, before, I just remember that before anything. Et cetera, et cetera. It's all 
It just felt like it had to be that rhythm at first. I mean, it goes to a lot of other places from that. But I love that. I love that. <laughs> World. Could you, as a singer, have sold Paradise? I don't know if there's a demo of you singing it, but there's certain songs, like the ballads and the sweet songs, that your voice, you have a great singer songwriter kind of voice. Yeah, but I don't like singer songwriter voices, so I was thrilled when Meatloaf came around. Um, I actually sang much, when I was in school, I sang really well, and then I had this real accident and had my nose all screwed up, and I couldn't sing after that. It was really difficult, and I lost like an octave of range. And that's why he was like this gift from the gods, because he could sing it all. And I'd much rather hear him sing it than me any day. I mean, he's a great voice. For the record, the name of your high school band was? Oh, <laughs> no, college. He was oh. in college. The original band was the, the clitoris that thought it was a puppy. <laughs> well, it was, it, was, it was my second name. They, uh, <laughs> I forget. The first name was really dirty, and everyone objected to it. said, well, this one will sound like a Disney movie. And it still does sound like a Disney movie, doesn't it? You know, the clitoris that thought it was a puppy, you know. You know, it's like his own little cartoon. It's Randy, that should be a Randy Newman song. The clitoris that thought it was a puppy. What do we say? Bow wow. Well. <laughs> Something like that. But um, yeah, the clitoris that thought it was a puppy. And in England, I found out how to say clitoris. <laughs> they pronounce it differently. Kevin Kelly was the earliest song from the record. Musically, where did that one start? Do you remember? As I remember, that started with a very simple piano arpeggiated. It's almost like a lullaby. It's really one of the simplest ones. I remember thinking it just sounded like a music box. So it had this very simple. That's very, it's nothing but piano and voice on the record. Uh, there's no other instruments. It was, uh, I mean, there's an orchestra way behind, but. Uh, I just wanted it to be like that. Uh, again, that was for Neverland. That was my Peter Pan musical. And that was a song that Wendy sang after she married Peter. It's pretty intimidating for other singers to cover something that Meatloaf did, like on that, because mm -hmm. he sort of owned, sort of mm -hmm. territorialized yeah. them. Uh, are, you, do you, are, you always, are you happy with the amount of covers people have done? I'd love more covers, but you know, I, I think they are intimidating. You know? In a way, it's a cool compliment when something isn't covered much. I mean, I've had tons more covers of Total Eclipse of the Heart and some of the other songs I've done, which are pretty difficult too, but the meatloaf, well, meatloaf ones are really scary because there aren't many male singers who can do that. They're vocally really demanding and dramatically challenging. And for some reason, there are more divas than there are whatever a male diva is. You know, it's just more people likely to want to soar and explore like that female right now than there are male. Uh, talking about great divas, Phil Rizzuto. What did Phil Rizzuto uh, bring to Paradise? Uh, Phil's wonderful. He, Milof and I were both fanatic Yankee fans. And um, when I was writing the song, I knew, I sort of had a sense of the structure, and I knew it was going to start as a flashback, which it does. I remember every little thing as if it happened yet, only yesterday. And I knew it would have to then go to the actual flashback. And ha I, I just wanted to write a sex scene. And I, I remember sitting there in this apartment trying to think, how am I going to do a sex scene without being filthy? And the first thought that occurred to me was the baseball code of going to first base, second base, third base, and home. And I don't know if I suggested it to meet or we got the idea together, but I just remember saying it's got to be Phil Rizzuto. Because he was the guy we saw every night on the Yankees. And he's still my favorite play-by-play -play guy. Partly because he's a brilliant play-by-play -play man, and he was. He was a great shortstop. But he was also fairly hallucinatory. <laughs> you wonder what medication Phil was on. He would just riff off on the most wild subjects and say anything. And he just had that sort of that Yogi Berra, a little bit of Yogi Berra in him. And um, when we when we decided to do it, I had to write it out. I wrote it out using all these full expressions, you know, using every holy cow that would fit, you know. He's gonna slide in, holy cow! He's gonna, you know. And it was very funny because we went to the session. And Todd Runger thought it was an idiotic idea. That was one of Todd's. Todd thought I had a lot of idiotic ideas. That was right at the top of the list. I remember Todd going. Phil who, why, why are we doing this <laughs> with Phil who? <laughs> and I said, well, it's a really good idea. The Yankees, play-by-play uh, -play man, the shortstop. Yes, and my 
question again is why are we doing this? And um, we had the session, Phil, it, we had to negotiate with Phil's agent for about a month. And Phil's agent was a guy named Art Shamsky, who was an outfielder for the New York Mets. Um, Phil needed a better agent because Phil got $1,000 to do that whole thing and he could have made a lot of money if he had asked for some sort of participation, but he didn't. And um, uh, when he came to do the session, he arrived at the studio in New York and he's a great guy. Um, and Todd arrived very reluctantly because he didn't think it was necessary, but Todd forgot to bring the tapes. So we had no tapes at all and Phil hadn't heard the song, which actually we thought was a blessing because we, we never told Phil it was like sexual stuff. We just said, you're going to do a play by play. It'll be fun. And uh, when Todd didn't have the tapes, he said, well, how am I going to hear what's going on? And I said, well, we'll just wild track it. We'll just put you on a tape and we'll make it fit. He said, well, okay. And I remember him saying, this isn't anything dirty. He said, no, no, it's about going from first base to home plate. And, um, and actually, one of the great things is to this day, Phil is like, um, has a great attitude about it. We went to Yankee Stadium in 78 or 79 to present the Yankees for the platinum record. And George Steinbrenner, and we presented some specific ones to Phil Rizzuto. And, uh, I remember we were in the dugout. It was a great day for me and me to be in the dugout at Yankee Stadium. It still thrills me more than any concert experience. It was just magnificent. And, um, and Phil Rizzuto comes running into the dugout from off field, yelling at us. He goes, Steinman, meatloaf, you huckleberries. Why didn't you tell me this was dirty? The nuns are never going to forgive me. I take more. Oh, they, they won't leave me alone at the church about this. He's really religious. And he says, uh, everyone is telling me, didn't you know that the kids are having sex in the car? Oh, holy cow. I'll never get over. My kids love it, though. My kids is their favorite. They like it more than my baseball sports cast. <laughs> and uh, you always remember, going, you huckleberries, you didn't warn me about this. And him ranting about the nuns. And it was this, I wasn't that surprised, though, because before we met Phil, some station somewhere in the country, St. Louis or something, was clever. They had gone out to spring training for the Yankees in Florida, and they had taped Phil's reactions. So I heard it first on tape. They said, we want to play something. And then, so Mr. Rizzuto, what did you think of that meatloaf, Paradise by the Light? Holy cow, that's a dirty thing. I didn't have any idea. You should hear the nuns. They just are so upset. You know, any song you can upset nuns with, you're halfway there with a rock and roll piece. <laughs> Though I do have this image of all these nuns dancing wildly to it, you know. Um, but he was great. And the funny thing was, he couldn't do it himself. It was one of these cases where someone can't be themselves. He had to go out there and do it without any music, just say it, which should make it easier. He doesn't have to, you know, time it to the music. And uh, he had the dialogue written out that I had written out. And he's going, and he was like, it's like a method actor. He couldn't get in character. And so Phil's out in the studio going, um, Okay, I'm ready. Let's go. And Todd would go, okay, take one. Holy cow. We got a real pressure cooker going here. Uh, uh, okay, uh, Phil, hold on. Hold on one second. It's, what's wrong? I'm reading what you wrote. No, no, it's not, it doesn't feel right. Well, what's wrong? I, uh, it's, it's not excited enough. You want to get you laid back. Oh, well, what, well how excited should I be? I said, well, very excited. Well, what game is this? Who are we playing? <laughs> he was like Robert De Niro all of a sudden. I said, who are you playing? He says, yeah, I mean, what time of the year is it? And who are we playing? And I said, okay, you're playing at the end of the year. It's, it's going to the playoffs. This is going to decide the playoffs. Oh, it's like a playoff decider. All right. Um, okay, let me try it again. And he tries again. He goes, okay, we got a real pressure cooker going here. Two down, nobody on bottom of the... And it drifts off again against Phil. He started good. He says... Well, you didn't tell me the team. You gotta tell me the team. I said, oh, it's the Red Sox. I'm, I'm sorry, I meant the Red Sox. Wow, it's the Red Sox. And it's a, this went on like about nine takes till we had it down to the specific pitcher, the catcher, who was on base, who was trying to get in base, the manager, everything was like specific. And when he finally got that, like the nine times, he says, okay, and he wrote everything down. He says, the Red Sox, and such and such pitcher, and he says, Louis, okay. Holy cow, we got a real pressure cooking. And it was perfect. It was great. It was Phil Rizzuto as Al Pacino. <laughs> you know, all he needed, it. he expected him any time to go, holy cow, Attica, Attica, Attica. <laughs> Just, Phil became a method actor. It was very cool to see. Did Todd think your idea for the uh, motorcycle was a bad idea? Uh, probably, you know, I don't know. You know, it's always, Todd's such a brilliantly deadpan. Uh, that he doesn't give away a lot. I'm just assuming because he thought probably 90% of my <laughs> ideas were bad ideas. Um, I suspect he did. Um, I know that I was a real crybaby about it. I mean, he did the whole, we had that whole song down and it was brilliant. It was, I remember one take and it was one amazing take and it had this big hole in it that, you know, I wanted a motorcycle. I wanted to hear motorcycles. And um, I think Todd felt it was all over. And uh, I was like, you know, the really annoying whining kid going, 
Todd, where's the motorcycle? You said we can have a motorcycle. I want a motorcycle. And the kid you wanted to slap around. And he says, oh, you want a motorcycle. You don't have enough. A thousand background vocals, a million guitar solos, a 10 minute song, you want a motorcycle. Yeah, I want a motorcycle. He says, all right. I said, do you have motorcycle sound effects? He said, no, I don't deal with sound effects. I'll do it with my guitar. And I said, how can you do that? You can do it with your guitar. I felt like a four-year-old. I always did that with Todd. I always felt like a four-year-old with his daddy because he's so much smarter in music. And, um, and so he said, I'll show you how I'll do it with my guitar. And if you hear the multitracks, you'll hear it's just one take. And I remember he had the most amazing guitar rack. It wasn't even big. It was like, you know, no higher than this piano. And he went over to, he said, let's see, motorcycle, here we go. He said, oh, oh, I remember this great Todd sarcasm. He goes, oh, I forgot to ask you, is it a Yamaha, a Kawasaki, or a Harley Davidson? And I said, oh, Harley Davidson. I thought so. <laughs> Why did I even ask? And then he actually, you know, you wonder what he thinks at Total Jackson. He goes and adjusts very specifically, like three buttons on his rack. And you don't know what he's doing. And then he did the motorcycle with his guitar. And it's still one of the most amazing, especially if you know it's one take. He just went there, it was like, <laughs> you hear it rev up, you hear the motor, you hear fire coming out of it, you hear it do a wheelie, that's my favorite thing. At one point it does a wheelie, you hear it go, <laughs> and you can just see it rise up and do a wheelie. I mean, it was amazing. I thought he was going to stop for gas. And, he, you know, it's like, with Todd, anything's possible. And, but I, I know that if he didn't think it was a bad idea, he certainly did when he heard me whining, because I was definitely whining. <laughs> well, I want my motorcycles. All revs up and you'll get to go. Where did that start? Oh, actually, that, that evolved a lot. You know, that's interesting. That's the one song on the record that uh, I had. Every song on the record I co-arranged with Todd. I really should say that's mostly his arrangement. Because what happened with that is that originally was a really a lot. Again, that was like a 10-minute song. And it started very slow, like a... sinister, it had a big sort of frantic dance in the middle. It was actually the whole suggestion of a life of a kid who's all wrapped up with no place to go. And um, I don't know if it's simply our aesthetic differences, which is a big part of it, or the fact I do remember that's the one time I got really sick. I had this terrible virus, flu or something. I was really healthy through the whole making of the record, but we were up in Woodstock. And uh, I got really sick, and I was actually in bed. I remember I couldn't do anything. And I remember Meatloaf coming up, saying, Jimmy, Jimmy! And he's like pulling me out of the bed. He's like, get out of the bed. Todd's ruining the song. He's ruining, he's ruining, he's gonna ruin it. Come, Jimmy, come on! Because Meatloaf did all this other stuff, and it was so, you know, it was like the others. It was a big, elaborate epic. And Todd, probably smartly, said, do they all have to be big, elaborate epics? Can't we have one that's just a song, a four-minute rock and roll song? And I probably said, no, I want an epic, I want an epic. And, um, and I remember me trying to pull me out of the bed. I said, I can't, man, I can't. He said, but he's going to ruin it. And it was pretty much Todd's range, and it's brilliant. I mean, it's a great range, and he was probably right. It, it should have been. You know, nothing was changed musically, but he just really streamlined it. And, uh, and then it was cool because we got Edgar Winter to come in and play saxophone on it. And that was funny. That was a Todd studio and this strange albino saxophonist arrives <laughs> and hits notes that don't even exist. And uh, it, was, it was cool. But that was, and that was one take, too. And that was, uh, though he did keep, I, I always did have it ending that way. It was the, my, I called it my Led Zeppelin tribute. We were so fast in the ending. Uh, and uh, Todd did that great. Um, Finally, one of my absolute favorites, uh, 2 out of 3 ain't bad. Where did that one begin? That began as a lyric. You said the name of the song. Two out of three in bed began with the lyrical idea. It began with a really good friend of mine who's now uh, married to my best friend from school, a woman named Mimi Kennedy. Uh, when I was complaining that no one wanted to sign us and no one seemed to like the music, saying, well, it's so complicated. Why don't you write something simple? And the oldie station was on in the other room or something, and they were playing Elvis, I Want You, I Need You, I Love You, which is a very simple song. And she said, why don't you write something like that? I said, well, I'll try. And I went home, and the best I could do was, I want you, I need you, but there ain't no way I'm ever going to love you. Don't be sad. Two out of three ain't bad. I still had to twist it around a bit. But it was still, it was definitely a conscious, that was, the album was basically finished, and they were complaining there were no singles. Um, which there probably wasn't. <laughs> Everything was like seven minutes long, and they wanted a pop single, and so, or a ballad. And uh, so I went to write that with that specific thought in mind. And um, that's where it began, as a lyric. And then musically, I always feel the inspiration of that was kind of country because I loved country music. Um, more old country music, like from the 50s, 
that I grew up as a kid hearing, Hank Williams and Patsy Cline, not the kind of stuff today, not like Garth Brooks and that, which is really pop. It was that country music that makes you want to take a shower because the dust is all over you, you know. Um, and uh, and I always loved country music lyrics because they had a love of words, and 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 because country music was so damn dark, it was so desolate, and I loved dark music, and I always thought that got overlooked how dark. I mean. I don't think you can get through Hank Williams' I'm So Lonesome and I Could Cry without needing, you know, Prozac or something. <laughs> it's just, that's as despairing a song as there is. And it always sounds to me like a, a lonely coyote just howling, in, you know, a dusty moonlit night. And, um, and, that, and the melody was country when I was first doing it. It was like, um, I don't know how the range will be, but... I want you, I need you, but there ain't no way. I'm ever gonna love you now, don't be sad Cause two out of three ain't bad Now don't be sad Cause two out of three ain't bad It was that kind of like Johnny Cash thing Cause it was way low, well I'm lower now but it was I want you, I need you, but there ain't no way I'm ever gonna love you. It was definitely the feel in my head, and then it just turned poppier. We made it pop, more pop and rock and roll. But it, in my head, when writing it, it was Johnny Cash on a lonely road with roadkill <laughs> surrounding him, singing back up. <laughs> I was singing with roadkill. Right, okay.
So you can do it directly to him, like, hey, John, I just want to say thanks, or you can just be, like, talking about John. Okay. And you could be irreverent and funny, or you could be serious, or you could do a little bit of both, because we're doing, you know, we have a whole bunch of stuff. Okay. Is that piano all right for you? Do you want prompts? Do you want somebody to ask you questions about John? Mm -hmm. No. Rowan. Rowan? Uh, I just wanted to say that one of my fondest memories of when I f first started out in the music business doing Bat Out of Hell with Meatloaf <clears throat> was that we had very few believers and a lot of naysayers. And one of the believers I really remember vividly was John Sykes, who was at that time, if I remember correctly, the head of uh, college promotion in Buffalo, New York for CBS Records, and uh, believed in the record unbelievably. And early on in 77, we were up in Buffalo to do a concert, and there was an enormous blizzard, even by Buffalo standards, which means it was pretty superhuman to even exist through it. And, you know, something like 400 feet of snow, the usual. And, uh, we were on the top rock and roll station in Buffalo, and uh, we were pushing the show, and all of a sudden they had to stop because the mayor of Buffalo went on every radio station in Buffalo to announce, basically, with this great sense of seriousness, he says, please stay home, please do not leave your homes for the next 48 hours. This is one of our biggest storms this century. We'll take care of it, but don't leave your homes. That was the key to his message. And then it came back to us, and I remember immediately Meatloaf going, Everybody, come out to the show tonight. Come out, it's going to be a great show. Don't listen to him. Come out to the show. And Sykes was right there, and John says, That's right, do that. We'll make sure it's full. It'll be full. It'll be full. And I remember, and that was just a tiny example. And I, I think in the, any guy who can be this passionate and this reckless at the same time has got to be a great believer in, in artistic vision and a great executive for anything involved with the arts. And uh, he went right from Buff. We raved about him afterward. I, I'm going to act like me and Meatloaf take all the credit for what happened to John, but we went back to CBS and raved about John Sykes in Buffalo. Next thing I know, they were moving into Chicago. And next thing I know, he's running uh, VH1, and now he's apparently going to be the next president. But that's obviously a step down. But uh, I just wanted to thank John for being an early believer and for his wonderfully passionate recklessness, uh, which is part of believing. So I'm not surprised at anything that happens to him. And thanks, John. Never got to say that. Perfect. Thanks. Hey. Thanks. What? Oh, okay. What am I doing? <laughs> oh, I'm playing. Oh, okay. Sorry.
Oh, sure. Great.